want to read from Mark chapter 10 this morning, um, from verse 46. And it says there, as they were going up the road to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking ahead of them. Now, I'm reading from a translation called the Berean Standard Bible, so it might look slightly different on the screen. The disciples were amazed, but those who followed were afraid. Again, Jesus took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will deliver him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise again. Amen. And so we're in Holy Week this week, in Passion Week. Next Friday is Good Friday. And then we have Resurrection Sunday. And so this is to bring a focus for us onto this week ahead. And why not start with looking at the last miracle that Jesus did recorded in Mark before he went to the cross. Before we get to Bartimaeus, James and John came to Jesus and declared, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow, it's an audacious request. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. So Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? They answered, grant that one of us may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in glory. And Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup I will drink or be baptized with the baptism I will undergo? The brothers answered, we can. You will drink the cup that I will drink, Jesus said, and you will be baptized with the baptism that I undergo but to sit at my right or my left hand is not mine to grant. It's not for me to give you that. These seats belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that those regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their superiors exercise authority over them. But it shall not be this way among you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. I think Jesus was trying to get the message through to James and John that... Um, it's better to humbly implore than to demand. Goes on then to this account of Bartimaeus. Next they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho with a large cr crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many people admonished him to be silent, but he cried out all the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And you get a picture of it, the crowd, the noise, the dust, just the, 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 the commotion, and he has been sitting probably in this usual place for all his life probably, most of it, and he's crying out to Jesus. He's heard that Jesus is coming past. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. You can imagine this, a couple of the disciples went over and says, okay, take courage, get up. Jesus is asking for you, he's calling for you. This is amazing. Throwing off his cloak, <laughs> Bartimaeus jumped up and came to Jesus. Throwing off his cloak. 
What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. That's the title of the message today. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Rabboni, which means teacher, said the blind man, let me see again. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this morning's message is, qu is quite brief, but I just want to bring a focus onto a few things in this passage of Scripture. First of all, there are occasions when Jesus is right next to the people that need him. His, he's right in our midst. His presence is in our midst. And he, he's right next to people that need his help. And he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? And I think there can be no doubt if anybody hears that, if Jesus says to anybody, what do you want me to do for you? They have just been presented with the greatest opportunity that they'll ever be, that they'll ever be presented with. Amen. And it's there for us to embrace if we want it. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? How many times did Bartimaeus cry out? Well, I don't know how many times he cried out, but he cried out until he was heard. And he cried out. He must have strained his vocal cords because it would have been loud. But I, while I was studying this, I came across this word that we don't use very much anymore, and it's called imploring. So Bartimaeus was imploring Jesus, and then to implore is to ask someone to do something in a very sincere, emotional, and determined way. And Bartimaeus was imploring Jesus. The word is very similar to importunity. I know we're getting a bit of an English lesson here as well, but to importune someone or to implore them is to plead with them. And um, I want to just expand on that a little, bit, a little bit. In Luke chapter 11, verse 5 in the Amplified Bible, Jesus says to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine who's on a journey has just come to visit me and I have nothing to serve him. And from inside he answers, don't bother me. It's, it's late. It's midnight. What are you doing here? The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Then Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, just because he is his friend... Yet, because of his persistence and boldness, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Amen? Persistence. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking persistently receives, and he who keeps on seeking persistently finds, and to him who keeps on knocking persistently, the door will, the door will be opened. God's Word said it, the door will be opened. Importunity, imploring, it's, it, there's an urgency to it, and there's a persistence to it, even to the point of being annoying or troublesome. And if, if any of you, I'm sure we've all been there, we've either been at one, of, one end of this when your Wayne comes and says, Daddy, Daddy, can I have, can I have this? Oh, son, you know, Daddy, Daddy, can I have this? And eventually, because of his persistence, Daddy, Daddy says, okay, Daddy, you know, some people would say gives in or relents. <laughs> but his persistence and his sincerity and his determination, and of course, Daddy has the wisdom to know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that he's asking for. And so 
you know, or, or you've been in that position where you've gone to someone and, you know, uh, I've asked, but I'm not going to go and ask again because, you know, this is just going to get awkward. This is just going to get difficult. This is going to put a strain on the relationship. What will they think of me? Well, what does God's word say? You go to your friend and you ask, you keep on asking. That friend, if he is a friend, will get up and he'll help you. Amen? Now, Jesus here is saying, implore. Importune me. And that challenges the way we understand prayer because we think, and I know we do, you only need to pray and ask once because God knows he's, he's heard our prayer. He's heard our prayer. And then we say, okay, well, we've, we've, we've asked and now we're just going to believe and we keep on believing and, and giving thanks. But it would seem you know, to God that he in some way desires that we would be persistent in prayer. Amen. Our heartfelt desire, he wants to see that. Otherwise, we can become very casual in our prayers. And, you know, God, it's not a vending machine where you just go, this is my prayer for today. But we press in in prayer. Who's ever heard that before? Pressing in, pushing, pushing in in prayer. And so these prayers of, of imploring and, and, and persistence, they have value to God because do you know what it does? It humbles us. We don't just, you know what, um, Lord, I want, this is what I want. I want to sit at your left or your right hand. And, you know, importunity puts us in a position where we need to humble ourselves. And we recognize that there's no other way out of this. This is, this is all I have left is my prayer, and I'm going to keep on praying this prayer. And so to take that position is not easy. Amen? And so when we begin to pray and implore God, we, we really abandon, you know, that place. It, this is our last chance. I don't say it mean last chance, but there's the, you're all we have left, Lord. You're all we have left. Everything else, we leave that behind, and you're all we have left. Amen? And it's just like in many of Jesus' Jesus's parables, you know, the widow, like the, the widow, she pleaded with Jesus from a place of desperation. She had, it was the last thing that she had was, was Jesus. I'm going to cling on to you and I'm going to ask you and I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop asking. And all pride and all pretense goes out the window. And we will do whatever it takes to be free or delivered, or whatever the prayer is for. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? Sometimes the situations we pray about, are, they are beyond our control, and we have to give it all over to God, and we have to shout Hosanna, which means rescue us, save us, and we shout that Hosanna, and when I believe when God hears Hosanna, He reaches out, and he hears us, and this is what Bartimaeus did. Bartimaeus did. He shouted out like that way, amen? And so, sometimes we have to implore the Lord. When Jesus met the woman at the well, his first re response to her was a little bit off-handed, but she kept on. She didn't give up at the first response, amen? So, you know, don't give up and turn away. Keep on imploring and importuning the Lord. Amen. And so I believe that when we pray that way, it's His will that we pray that way. He does promise to hear us and answer us. Amen. He's faithful. I believe God hears every prayer we pray, even the ones we pray that are out of His will. And then He will then I believe, witness to us to change the way we pray so that we pray within His will, according to His will. Amen. We pray, Father God, not Your will, not, not my will, but Your will be done. Amen. And so, there's places 
where we can come together as the church, like this morning, you know, and, and we can implore as we worship, as Pauline leads us, and she goes into a free flow of worship, and we begin to focus on God. It's our moment together to implore the Lord, to ask Him, for, amen, to ask Him and to resolve situations that we think are not resolving, issues, you know, you're, 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 you're fighting issues with personal circumstances or in your body that, that, that seem to be going down a spiral with no hope of getting back out again. And um, I believe that when we pray with persistent expectation that God hears us, amen? And also Bartimaeus, he made a fuss. He's like, I'm just going to make a fuss until something happens. And so a lot of us, who, who likes to make a fuss? No, some of us are like, um, I don't really like to make a fuss. You know, I don't want to cause, I don't want to, you know, cause any ripples here, cause any waves. But he just made a fuss until he was noticed. And then Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus never beat around the bush. He says, I want my sight back. I want my sight back. And so it's quite meaningful that Bartimaeus took his cloak off. I can imagine him energetically casting his cloak off, his outer garment, and making way to Jesus. And as a beggar, that would probably have been something that kind of was a distinguishing feature that he had. I mean, you've seen in the video there the kind of the, kind of the sackcloth type of look that he had. But, you know, that would have been a distinguishing feature that he had. He was begging, he was blind, and that's what he had to do every day to survive. And there's a lot in this, in that the Pharisees, if you read about the Pharisees, they also wore outer garments. And they, they were the scribes and the Pharisees were the religious people but they used to embellish their outer garments and make the hems larger and decorate the hems of them and all of this. And they did all that de deliberately because they had an image to maintain. I don't imagine they'd have wanted to cast off their outer garments because they had an image to maintain. And they stayed shackled to that image because that garment said something about who they were. Well, Bartimaeus' garment kind of said something about who he was. But in a moment, he tosses that garment off and he says, I'm going to be free from this image that people have of me. I'm going to be free from what I've been for, for my whole life. Amen? So he casts it off because he's like, this is going to be my last day as a blind man. Isn't that amazing? This is my last day as a blind man. I'm, today I'm coming, I'm going from the world of darkness into the world of light. It's my last day. And I'm convinced that he knew that today, that day was going to be his last day as a blind man. And he's saying, my future is not going to resemble my past. My past is, 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 is in the past. It's in your behind. <laughs> it's nothing you can do about it. The past is in your behind. And so many times, I mean, uh, uh, just, just to be personal for a moment, this week I felt so, such, so, such a burden when I was sitting in the car somewhere this week and I was just thinking about, well, I was thinking about the past actually and I felt my shoulders becoming sore with the weight of what I was thinking about and I says, God, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And I, and I, and I have to remember that my past is my past and... Um, you know, I've got, we've, got to, we've got to just, we've, we've got to cast it off like a robe. We've got, to ca we've got to cast it off and we've got to bound out of that situation. And Bartimaeus, his testimony is like this. He's like, I don't need this cloak anymore. I'm getting it off. Because that covering that he wore at the side of the road was a worthless covering. And then all of a sudden he goes into a covering, a supernatural covering, meeting Jesus. 
And Jesus is then becomes his covering because the word says that from that moment on, Bartimaeus followed Jesus. I believe that Bartimaeus became a devoted follower of Jesus. I mean, you, you, you're healed from blindness. You're, you're going to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. And I mean, that, you know, there's no such thing as a minor or a major miracle. When God does something like that, when, when you were saved, that was a miracle. And it's worthy of following Jesus for the rest of our lives because we, he has taken us from out of the covering of darkness into his light. Amen. And so, you know, talking about this, why would we want to be, stay attached to something that had no worth? Why would we want to stay attached to something that had no value? Things that are cumbersome. He, he tossed his cloak, cloak off, not wanting to be impeded or obstructed by anything. Just he wanted to get straight to Jesus. And there was another word I came across that we don't use in English very much these days, the word languish. Languish. And that's quite an interesting wor word. Languishing means to remain in an unpleasant situation. And Bartimaeus is like, I'm not going to languish here any longer. I ha this life is, is it, it, this is a life of feebleness. And I'm begging, and I'm not going to languish in this any longer. I'm not going to remain in this unpleasant situation any longer. And so whatever was impeding him, he just cast it off in that moment. He didn't want to stay there. And the word reminds us that we need to lay aside everything that weighs us down. Lay aside the things that, you know, the, the sins of our past. And the thing is, we are so, we live lives of regret. And we need to know that when we ask the Lord for forgiveness, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then those things are gone. That's what we've been talking about for six weeks, the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so we sometimes have to just cast things off. Pursuits. You know, sometimes we have to cast off good things as well as bad things. We have to cast off things that seem good. Possessions affections, occupations have to be put away sometimes altogether. Amen? But when he says, what do you want? He really means that. When we go to him, he says, you, you can have what you've come for. Amen? You can have what you've come for. And Bartimaeus was helpless to do anything other than beg. So where was his provision? He was self-sufficient. His begging was his sufficiency. He, had, he identified as a beggar. And the people around him identified him as a beggar. That was his self-image. Image. He had nothing else to frame his life by. His life was a picture of being blind and begging. His life was framed by his circumstances. And I want to encourage us this morning that your life does not have to remain in the frame of your circumstances. Your life doesn't have to remain the way it has been. So as soon as the presence of Jesus, and that's why I encourage you to come to church and wherever you can be, be with believers or be in your home and cultivate the presence of God because whenever Jesus comes near, we get the opportunity to go to him and he says, what do you want? And then we can say, Lord, today, this is what I want. This is what I want. Amen. So he casts this thing off and that was his burden to bear, which was no sight, no vision. And you see there, he's Jesus opens his eyes. Your faith has made you well. And for the first, can you imagine what it must be like for the first time ever to see something? You know people that have been born without hearing and through the technology we have now, they are able to give someone the, the gift of hearing. 
Have you ever seen their faces when they hear something for the first time? It's absolutely amazing. And so this, this man, this is the initiation of vision and sight. And it's not just his physical sight, it's his spiritual sight as well. And so Jesus wants to initiate vision in us. What did, the, what did he say? He says, isn't it, isn't it strange that it's those who can see that are often the most blind? <clears throat> and our eyes are wide open in this world, but sometimes our spiritual eyes are shut. And it's time for us to open our spiritual eyes. Jesus wants to initiate your spiritual sight and open your eyes. And when we think, we talk about Apollos and Myrtle and Goa and the persecution that's coming against them, do you know what? We need to have our spiritual eyes open. We need to have our spiritual eyes open. And, and I'm just, we were yesterday morning, um, I don't know if the reeds are here this morning, I'm not sure. Oh, they are. Um, um, Amelia was doing her recital and uh, uh, it was in the lodge I'm just going to say the lodge here in Cowinning Main Street. And we said, we're going, to come and, we're going to come and support you, Amelia. We're going to come and see you do your, say your poem. And, and by the way, she implored me. She says, oh, Pastor David, if I win, can I say my poem in the church? <laughs> and she, she implored, she's been imploring me for weeks. So you're going to get that later on. <laughs> but so I'm, 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 for the first time, in my life, I, I set foot in the lodge, number nothing of co-winning, and I was, all of my sensitivities were completely turned, switched on. And I knew why I was there, but I thought, oh my, we need our spiritual eyes open. We need our spirit. You, we, we, or else we do not see what is happening on our own doorstep. We don't know what's going on in our city, in our town, and we need to have our spiritual eyes open. Amen? Last scripture I've got is 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is about King Jehoshaphat and all the nations um, coming against them, God's people. And he says to the Lord, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast army that comes against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes. And I believe that not only when the, when the word says, lift up your heads, lift up your eyes and look to the hills from there is where your help comes from. In a physical sense, I do that. We do that. We lift our eyes up, but the eyes of our spirit are lifted. The eyes of our um, hope, the eyes of our expectation, the eyes of, of, of our desire are fixed and fastened on Him. And that's what we look to. We look to Him for advice and direction and help and protection. And so, I pray this morning that our eyes are opened, opened, open eyes. And so we know that Jesus then went into the city and that, um, there were palm, uh, palm leaves and branches laid before him and all the people were crying out Hosanna as he came into the city. But the situation turned in the matter of a week. And I'm, I, there were others in the city that wanted to see him put to the cross. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for future content, please subscribe. And if anything spoke to you or was relevant to you, please leave a comment. If you want to find out more about the church, how to support the ministry or connect with us, then go to bridge-church.com. So until next time, thank you for joining us and goodbye.